you raise a number of lines of evidence and issues where the Smithsonian's Human Origins exhibit gets the evidence wrong regarding human evolution. The first issue you raise is the percent human-chimp genetic similarity. What exactly does the Smithsonian claim about human-chimp genetic similarity? Yeah, so Andrew, I guess I've kind of been collecting claims that the Smithsonian Institution makes about human origins for a long time. Uh, as you may recall, uh, we had a conference in D.C. in 2023 and had the opportunity to actually go to the Smithsonian Museum, took a lot of photographs and kind of really was curious about what are they saying about human origins. Uh, my wife was actually in D.C. for a friend's graduation uh, that was right there on the Washington Mall back in May, and I had her go back and check and confirm, okay, are some of these claims still there? So yeah, what do they say about the percent genetic similarity between humans and chimps? Well, uh, you may not be too surprised given, you know, we've all heard that old statistic that humans and chimps are maybe only one to two percent genetically different. We've been talking about this a lot here on ID the Future and also on Evolution News lately. So the Smithsonian is no exception to this rule. When you walk into their human origins exhibit, you are immediately confronted with this big picture on the wall of a human being and chimpanzees and other and other apes. And it says, you and chimpanzees, 98.8% genetically similar. And then there's a little caption uh, further down in that exhibit that says, there's only about a 1.2% genetic difference between modern humans and chimpanzees throughout much of their genetic code. So there you have it, the Smithsonian presenting this old 1% genetic difference or 1.2% genetic difference icon of evolution. And they're very explicitly using this as an argument for human chimp common ancestry. Yeah. Well, at the very least, it needs updated. And at worst, this is something that's been miseducating for a long time. Now, we've heard this statistic before. Can you give us some other examples of mainstream sources arguing for human evolution based upon this supposed claim that we're 1% genetically different? Yeah, sure. So we're going to talk in just a second, Andrew. We're going to recap the, the big paper in Nature that came out in April showing that we're more like 15% genetically different from chimpanzees. But sometimes the response you get from people is they will say, well, look, we've known for a long time that we're more than 1% genetically different from chimps. And my response is, well, you're right. We would have known this for a long time. We didn't know it was 15% exactly until just recently. Uh, but we've known for a long time that we're way more than 1% genetically different. Given that fact, you have to ask yourself the question, why are all these very prestigious and very mainstream scientific sources claiming that we're only 1% genetically different? You know, don't attack me. Uh, you know, we should be critiquing these various sources that have been saying that we're only 1% genetically different. It's funny how our evolutionist friends are so quick to forget about this. So let's remind our friends of some examples from recent memory of people saying that we're only 1% genetically different from uh, chimpanzees. Uh, Bill Nye, in his book, Undeniable, which came out in 2014, he said, we share around 98.8% of our gene sequence with chimpanzees. This is striking evidence for chimps and chumps to have a common ancestor. So he's very explicitly saying that we are, you know, 99, 98.8% uh, genetically similar to a chimpanzee. Um, another example, there's a book that was written, uh, published by University of Chicago Press in 2008. I think it was authored by something like seven university professors. And the title of this book is 99% Ape, How Evolution Adds Up. So they're very clearly using that 99% genetic similarity statistic as an argument for evolution. In fact, you can see on the cover that there's this drawing of Darwin who's sort of being portrayed like an ape, as if this, you know, this great scientist, Charles Darwin, he was obviously a great scientist and he was a human being, but they're making him look like, oh, he's really just an, another kind of ape because he's so similar to apes, genetically speaking. And the book says of the roughly 3 billion letters of the genetic code, the difference is just 1.06%. And so they're saying the difference is, quote, 1% of 3 billion. So they're very explicitly saying when you look at the entire genetic code of human beings, you know, not just the gene coding DNA, but the whole genome, that only 1% is different from chimpanzees. And on the back, they say that Darwin was mocked for suggesting that humans have apes for ancestors. But every scientific advance in the study of life in the last 150 years has confirmed the reality of evolution, unquote. That's an exact quote. They're saying that every scientific advance has confirmed evolution. So they are very strongly promoting evolution in this book. And as you can see, the title, one of their main arguments is that we are, quote unquote, 99% ape, genetically speaking. Um, we could give other examples. There was an article in Science in the year 1998 that said that humans and chimpanzees 
share at least 98.5% of their DNA. Uh, Financial Times, uh, sort of popular media, very mainstream media source, 2012, uh, said we share 98% of our DNA with our nearest, nearest living relative, the chimpanzee. Uh, we could do this all day, talking about sources, you know, the Smithsonian right now as we speak says that we're 98.8% genetically similar to chimps. So we could do this all day. The sources span mainstream scientific journals to academic books, to science popularizers, to science museums, to mainstream media. And they're all saying that we are 98, 99% genetically the same as a chimpanzee. And note that many of these sources are explicitly applying this only 1% genetic difference statistic or 2% statistic to all of human DNA, not just to certain protein coding genes. So they're making a very specific claim for, and they're making it as an argument for evolution. And this is where it becomes very interesting when you look at this new nature paper and, and what it says the evidence actually shows. Yeah. But it's definitely something that's an icon of evolution they've had a lot of fun with. I mean, that 1% number, you know, is easy to remember, easy to spout. And I'd forgotten that Bill Nye said chimps and chumps. I mean, they've just had a lot of fun with this one. So it's a little unfortunate that we have to come along now and, well, not us, but, you know, this this paper and this update to say, ah, actually, let's uh, let's take a closer look here. Now, I know that you and Emily Reeves did a podcast on ID the Future a couple months ago, but what does the evidence actually show about the real percent genetic similarity between humans and chimps? Yeah, so this paper was by you et al. in Nature. It came out in April of this year, and it basically presented complete sequences, what they call telomere to telomere sequences of various ape genomes, including chimpanzees. Um, and these were sequences, genome sequences that were sequenced from scratch, meaning they did not use the human genome as sort of a guide as they assembled the genome. That had been done actually with some previous drafts of the chimp genome, which made the chimp uh, genome look actually more similar than it actually is to human beings. So this is a first time presenting complete telomere to telomere sequences of the chimp genome and other ape genomes and that they were sequenced de novo. And what it basically found is that we're about, the total is about, we're about 15% genetically different from chimps. So let's break that down. 1.6% of the difference comes from sections that are easy to align. And most of the genome does align pretty well between humans and chimps. So among our two genomes, 1.6% difference when you talk about what we, what they call single nucleotide variations. Those are basically you're aligning the two genomes and you get individual nucleotides that are different. However, there are major sections of the genomes that either fail to align or as they put it, could not be aligned in a one-to-one manner. So basically there were alignment problems because they were so different or because basically there were sections of one genome, maybe extra copies of a repeat that were not present in the other. And so they they couldn't align them easily. And they found that about 13.3% of the genome had what they called a gap divergence. Basically there's a gap in one genome compared to the other and this caused alignment problems. And when you add, you can basically add these two types of differences up. They're just counting percent nucleotides that are different, uh, one being the single nucleotide variation, the other being the, uh, what they call the gap divergence. But, you know, they're both percentages of the total genome that are different. You can add them up 1.6% plus 13.3% equals 14.9%. So about 15% genetically different uh, between humans and chimps. And they actually used another statistic that they called a progressive cactus alignment. And in that uh, estimate, I think they found that we were somewhere around 15 or 16 percent genetically different from chimps. So two different methods here of actually doing the analysis gave roughly pretty similar results. We can call it 15 percent that were genetically different from chimpanzees. So that's obviously far different than what the Smithsonian is claiming when they say that we are only 1.2 percent genetically different or 98.8 percent the same. You know, this is a difference that is greater by, you know, over an over to order magnitude compared to what the Smithsonian and many of these other sources have been claiming. And you know, we've all heard this statistic, right, Andrew? We don't have to like, people are not surprised when we tell them, oh, have you ever heard that claim that we're 99% similar to a chimp, genetically speaking, or that we're only 1% genetically different? People have heard this claim. So why do they resonate with this? Because it's been an argument that's been made very frequently to the public. This is nothing new. We're not distorting what many evolutionists have said. Certainly some folks have said, no, the difference is greater. That's good. Good for them. I'm very, very glad that some folks got it right. But what about all the times that people were getting it wrong? This is the point we're trying to make. 
that this argument for human evolution based upon the claim that we are only 1% genetically different, it's wrong. We are far more than 1% genetically different. And you know, you can argue for evolution if you want, but at least get the numbers right, and then we'll go from there and see what the evidence really shows. Um, and so this has become what Jonathan Wells called an icon for evolution, basically a very common argument for evolution that is just factually wrong. It's also actually logically wrong. I mean, I would argue that the percent genetic similarity between humans and chimps really doesn't tell you anything about whether we share a common ancestor because those genetic similarities, they could be the result of common descent, but they can also be the result of common design where a designer is reusing you know, similar parts and different designs. So I've going back for many years, I've never thought that the percent genetic similarity really answers very many interesting questions in the debate. But apparently some evolutionists feel otherwise. They think that it makes a very strong argument for evolution. And what we're saying is that that argument is wrong on both the, the facts. We're not 99% similar genetically to that, to a chimpanzee. And it's also wrong on the logic. Because logically speaking, I don't know why the percent genetic similarity makes an argument for human chimp common ancestry. I, I just don't see that there's a logical argument there. Anyway, this was the first example I gave in the New York Post op-ed, Andrew, of where the Smithsonian is basically misstating the scientific evidence and getting the evidence wrong as it tries to make a case for human evolution to the public.